Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Welcome back and thanks for stopping by. So welcome to your educational channel for all your wine information. And we're here looking at the videos to help you with your WSET courses. And this is on wine production for the level four. So this is the diploma around the world of maturation and the role of lees and things like autolysis, etc., in maturation of wine. As always, if you do have any concerns, questions, comments, you can get in touch. You can do so by the comments section on this YouTube video. Please make sure you also click subscribe or by the social media that you see at the bottom of every slide. There's also a direct route as well, and that is info at winewithjimmy.com. Okay, so let's have a look at the next few slides. So here we are. Now, this is split into two parts, and this one is on the role of lees in maturation. And part two, we'll be looking around the, um, the processes like batonage and racking. So we'll go through that in a bit greater detail. Part two is only available on the e-learning portal at with jimmy.com. But on this one, we're looking at the main concepts here behind lees in maturation, and we're going to need to understand exactly what lees is. We're going to need to understand what it can do to the final wine style, some advantages, disadvantages, labeling terms, um, all those kind of concepts, concepts we'll go through to understand the role of lees. So first of all, we need to know what it is. What are lees. So lees, as you can see just here, they really, the, the overarching theme of it is it describes the sediment that you find at the bottom of a wine vessel. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a deposit, a sediment that's found within our liquid. It is made up of, of course, dead yeast cells, but also dying yeast and bacteria, uh, potentially some grape fragments, uh, also precipitated tannins, nutrients, and sometimes some other insoluble compounds as well. And you can see in that picture there, it's been mixed up a bit, the barrel's been shaken around, and you can see that shaken and stirred aspect means that the lees are stirring and becoming more suspended within the wine. So that's what lees exactly are. Now, some specific terminologies around lees. We have something called gross lees. So gross lees is the sediment that forms quickly after the end of fermentation. So we're looking really in the day that follows the end of the first fermentation. Uh, and that sediment which quickly gathers is called the gross lees. And of course, this is the larger and heavier particles and um, hence its name gross lees, so the heavier lees. And there is a vat where the gross lees that's been left behind is being scraped out. And I do not envy the job of going inside that hole and doing that, but I suppose somebody's got to do it. And what about another terminology here, the fine lees. So these are the smaller particles that may settle much more slowly uh, and they often set stay suspended within the wine throughout a long period of time. But of course, through the act of sedimentation, they will start to deposit at the bottom of the vat as well. And you can see in this picture of a barrel, uh, you'll see that there's actually different levels here. You'll see the gross leaves at the bottom and you'll see some fine leaves which has been sedimented. And even you can call the top part here, that will have suspended fine leaves in it as well. But some of that is being uh, deposited, as you can see in that middle layer. OK, so that's the aspect of fine leaves. Um, racking is something we're going to talk about in a bit greater detail in the next presentation. But just generally speaking, how we remove the lees from a cask is by racking. Uh, and it really is uh, the movement of one cask uh, of the wine from one cask to another. 
We'll go through that later in part two. Um, so that's how you get rid of it. However, of course, some winemakers actually want to keep their wine in contact with the lees. So they will not practice racking uh, to anywhere near the extent that you will find when you want to, of course, take it off the lees. So why do they do that? Well, let's talk about three main areas. Let's have a look on why we may wish to keep our wine in contact with the lees. First of all, short lees contact, as you can see up there on the slide, can help balance high acidity. So certain wine styles made from certain grape varieties in the world are going to be, when freshly made into a wine, exceptionally high in acidity. And in fact, this can be so high and it can be so intense, it can be almost enamel stripping in the mouth, which means winemakers will do certain things within their power to mitigate the effects of that acidity. And in places like Muscadet, for example, which is on the estuary of the Loire River up in northwest France, here you'll notice that Muscadets commonly are called Muscadet sur Lee, meaning Muscadet on the Lees. And that little bit of contact, which is often just the winter after the grapes have been picked and made into a wine, so normally only a few months, is really just to take the acidic edge off the wine. It's still going to be very high in acidity, but it's just helped balancing it a little part. OK, medium lees contact. So what do we mean by that? So short lees, we just learned, was maybe just a few months. Medium lees contact could be something like six months up to a year, something like that. And this can impart texture, mouthfeel and body, commonly done for varieties like Chardonnay or Chenin Blanc. So this is where we are giving it a bit more extended contact. Um, and maybe it is partly to balance acidities here as well. But the contact with the yeast will release manoproteins, which gives more body and more mouthfeel into the wine. And that's, of course, why we would say some Chenin Blanc and Chardonnays have a medium body towards full body. It will be the Lees contact will be one of the aspects that adds to that body. And then there is even longer Lees contact, potentially years. And in Champagne, typically something like three, four, five years. And that can impart aromas and flavours. So this is where we'd start to have yeast derived flavours such as biscuit, bread, brioche, bread dough, toast etc etc okay so that's longer lees contact and of course in champagne you would find that that lees contact is not only just for the aromas and flavors but for imparting texture mouthfeel and body and to help balance the exceptionally high acidities that we find in the champagne region just a little bit on labeling here because i want to give you one quick example because i just mentioned it as a short term Lee's contact. And this is the Muscadet Sevre et Main. And this is the largest Appalachians of the Muscadet area around the city of Nantes. Uh, and it clearly says here Sir Lee. Um, and this is always quite interesting for students to learn because they look at this and they've learned that the terminology Sir Lee means on the Lees. It's the French for on the Lees. So therefore, they immediately think that this wine must be bready or toasty or they must have something Lee's aroma or flavour associated to it. But linking it into what we've just learned on the last three slides, it isn't really done for the aromas and flavours because the contact is too little, nor is it really done for texture. In some instances, it will be, but for most, it isn't. For here, it really is to balance the really, really off the charts acidity we can find with muscadets. Um, now, some terminologies here that we will need to understand. We need to know what autolysis means within the role of lees. So after fermentation, the yeast cells will very slowly die and they break down and this um, real breakdown of the of the yeast cells is what we call autolysis. 
It releases compounds which contribute flavors, body and texture, like we just mentioned on the previous slides. Some of these compounds may bind with phenolic compounds in the grapes, which may reduce color and soften tannins. Okay. Compounds from the lees also bind with certain extractable components of the wood vessel that may be used, such as wood tannins and flavors. So therefore they can actually help reduce astringency and modify the characteristics of flavors from the wood. The aromas and flavors that we can expect, expect then. So, we are talking about a bit of extended contact with lees. Now, the precise aromas and flavors that lees contribute are quite hard to define, and they certainly cross into other boundaries, such as malolactic and also oak. A range of com compounds are released from yeast, and these compounds can react with the aroma compounds already in the wine. Uh, in that instance, actually, where you have a typical kind of pastry note from Lees, and then you have a fruitiness from the wine, maybe it's like a stone fruit, like apricot, then for me, that becomes quite apricot Danish-like. It has that kind of richness, and certainly on sweeter wines. In white wines, where the effects of Lees are generally much more significant, and as humans, we notice this more, aromas from Lees are described, as we know, from yogurt-like, uh, dough-like, toasty, biscuity, um, and here there's, there's plenty. There's pastries, croissants, uh, scones. Uh, you know, I put a few up there which are, are, are linked to this. But some of these can be remarkably subtle. Some of them can be a little bit more pronounced, depending very much on the amount of Lee's contact, the length that we are looking at. So autolysis, the length of the process, and also batonage here. So generally, the effects of Lee's aging, as we know, are felt more sensory-wise in white wines. And the effect of gross Lee's, if kept in contact with a white wine, is going to be more uh, intensive than the effect of fine Lee's because of the volume of them, the intensity of them. Um, to also go up and increase that, if you want to give your wine more contact, then you will help it along by stirring, which is batonnage, and this will be discussed in part two. So do go on to that video to have a look at the um, aspects of racking and batonnage. So how about some advantages of the world of autolysis? So why do we do it? So Lee's aging can help the stabilization of wine against unstable proteins, which could cause protein haze. Um, also, the Lee's could help protect the wine from oxygen, helping to maintain a very slow, controlled oxidation during maturation, and therefore lowering the requirement or the need for the addition of sulfur dioxide. So certainly this is a more natural process to be adopted if you are looking to really not manipulate your wine with sulfur dioxide. Okay, so no additives, for example, like natural wines or maybe some organic or biodynamic wines. Um, so this is that certainly a process will help uh, mitigate your use of sulfur dioxide. How about some issues with it then? Well, if the layer of the lees is far too thick, uh, and this of course is a problem which is gonna come from the gross lees, which can be a very thick, heavy sediment at the bottom of the barrel, it could produce volatile sulfur comp compounds, which are reductive volatile sulfur compounds, VSEs, as you can see up there on the slide. At certain concentrations, some of these compounds could act um, quite well within the wine. They can add complexity. However, um, you can find that it can be too dominant and it can give unpleasant aromas, reductive compounds such as rotten eggs, which come from very high levels of hydrogen sulfide, which is a term 
which is deemed as a fault when you have hydrogen sulfide. It's often found actually when yeast is struggling with fermentation as well, uh, you can find these reductive compounds, rotten vegetables, rotten eggs, for example. For example. Um, that smell, by the way, the rotten egg note, hydrogen sulfide, is something if you are used to thermal spars, natural th thermal spars that are found in the ground, then you will notice that because you'll find sulfur within the ground. And when you've got all that warmth of water, you actually have hydrogen sulfide being produced. And that's why when you get into these natural hot springs, you might have to pinch your nose because the smell of rotten eggs can be a little bit too intense to begin with. But then, of course, the wonderful environment of being in a hot spring overwhelms you and you forget about the smell of rotten eggs. OK, uh, so VSCs. And it is worth noting that, like I mentioned only about a few moments ago, they could be positive compounds. You could have um, some a uh, little bit of sulfury notes, which give this kind of uh, struck match characteristic, which can be actually wanted in the wine, or even smoke, for example, which is why we've got this picture on the slide. Other key points to note is that lees will provide nutrients for um, mo microbes, so mo um, microbial, um, and therefore can assist the growth of things like lactic acid bacteria, LAB, for malolactic conversion, but also encourage the de uh, development uh, of spoilage microbes, such as Brettanomyces, which is what this picture is of. So Brettanomyces in the background, just there. And cost implications, finally. So Lee's aging may increase the time the wine is stored at the winery before release, and this can increase, of course, the cost of final wine. Um, that's really because wines, when it is aged on the lees, will need to be monitored for, there are issues, like we mentioned just only a moment ago, that can arise. Uh, and also, if you're wanting to enact batonage, stirring of the lees, this will need to be done by hand, by sticking a baton or a stick into the bunghole like the man is doing here in this picture and stirring the lees. This is labour intensive, of course. Now, there are some examples to look at here. And um, one which is keenly given at this point is talking about Rueda. So Rueda is a wine style from the Castilla Lyon. Uh, it is on the uh, Douro River, so it's very close to Valladolid, uh, north of Segovia. Wonderful place. Uh, and very sort of fruity, inexpensive, cheap Rueda are finish, uh, finished, packaged and released very quickly after fermentation. So they go through their fermentation, they'll go through their stabilization and then bottling and then they're sent to market. And that's for inexpensive stuff. So Lee's contact here is nothing or very minimal. But there is Rueda that is much higher in quality. Uh, and it may be aged in tank on their lees for a few months before bottling, or actually for much longer than that, maybe six months, maybe even 12 months, and they will be um, more expensive. Also, you can find some being matured in barrel. If the wine is being matured in barrel, there is therefore unlikely to be any significant increase of cost because really you've already got your labor looking after the barrel. So adding in the aspects of batonage just comes into the normal daily routine. Uh, but of course, it does become a problem when you've got epic amount of, video, uh, for, of barrels, of course. So that brings me to the conclusion of part one here, talking around the role of leads. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video. As always, if you have any comments, questions or concerns, you can get in touch via the comments section below. Uh, so pop your comments, questions, concerns there. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to get two updates per week from me. Or you can do the social media you see at the bottom of every slide or direct at the wonderful world of Wine with Jimmy, www.winewithjimmy.com. Uh, if you do find yourself in wonderful old blighty shores here in London town, then you know we've got schools and a bar. So come and see us for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you. Bye.